night unlike any other. There was a stillness in the air, a quiet calm in the evening sky. Grace was on the horizon, an unfathomable mercy, a love deeper than anyone had ever known. This silent night was about to give way to a chorus which would change the world forever. For on this day, in the city of David, is born a Savior, Jesus, the Son of God, the Word in flesh. God had reached down from heaven to earth to draw us to himself, to make a way to bring us home. Today, the heart of God is on full display. For God so loved the world. Well, good morning, each and every one of you, and Merry Christmas Eve to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Let's all stand as we begin our service by singing together hymn 178. In 178, O come, all ye faithful. Let's sing together. his eternal kingdom and reign and will bring the world everlasting peace and joy. The fourth candle of the Advent is the candle of love. Its light is meant to remind us of the love that God has for us. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. He is God's love in human form. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our holy and righteous God made a way for us as sinful and fallen man to be forgiven and received into his family. 
That way was provided through the redeeming work of Christ the Son. Jesus was born that he would die in our place to purchase our freedom. What will that love look like manifested in the lives of God's people? Paul told the Corinthian believers that love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We light this candle today to remind us of how God's perfect love is found in Jesus and is to be modeled by those who have trusted in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your gift of love, shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ our Lord. We also praise you for the privilege of being able to model that love to a world in desperate need of it. As Christ demonstrated your perfect love for us through the work of the cross, may we demonstrate our love for you through the fruit of our lives. May your great name be glorified. We pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, and thank you uh, to the Bookmer family for lighting our Advent candle for us this morning. And thank, thank all of you for being here today as we uh, worship and celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're here visiting with us this morning, I want to send a special welcome to you here at the Community Chapel of Heston. Uh, if you haven't already, I want to encourage you after the service, make sure you stop by the Welcome Center out in the lobby. Um, someone will be there um, and answer any questions you may have about us here at the church. And we have a small gift that we would like to give to you uh, for being here with us today and for worshiping with us. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that after the service. Um, we are excited to be having our Christmas cantata this morning. So just in a few minutes, our choir is going to be coming and sharing with us this morning, ministering to us in music. And so I hope that you're looking forward to that. Uh, with that said, just an uh, announcement, um, in case you were unaware, there will not be any children's church this morning. Um, so everyone's going to stay in here throughout the service um, and listen to our cantata. And so hopefully you're all looking forward to that. But a couple quick announcements that I have um, want to highlight for us. Hopefully you received a bulletin as you came in. If you have any questions about anything in there, you can see me afterwards and I can answer those questions for you. But um, do want to highlight, don't forget tonight. Tonight we have our candlelit service at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary. So hopefully you're all planning on coming back and being a part of that service. Uh, it's one of my favorite services of the year. Uh, so be sure to come, invite all your friends and family members. Uh, it be a wonderful time um, of song and scripture and getting to light our candles afterwards. And so again, hopefully you're planning on joining us for that. Along with that, tonight at our service, we will be taking our special Christmas Eve love offering during our evening service tonight. And so we've been announcing that for, for quite a while, but uh, we're taking that special offering and everything that will be given this evening will be divided evenly amongst eight different uh, missionaries, ministries, outreaches that are listed there in your bulletin as a special Christmas gift this year. So hopefully you've been prayerfully considering how you'd like to give towards that. And, but again, that will be happening this evening as well. Um, another thing I wanted to just briefly mention, um, and again, this is in your bulletin, but be sure to mark your calendars for Sunday, January 14th. Um, that Sunday will be our annual congregational meeting here at the church, uh, directly following the morning worship service. And so uh, during that meeting, we'll be voting on different leadership positions uh, for the coming year. Uh, we'll also be just kind of looking forward to what we have planned for the coming year. And then after that meeting, we will all just uh, have a time of fellowship down in the gymnasium with a meal to follow. And so um, everyone is encouraged and invited to attend that meeting, whether you're a, a member or not. Um, um, only members will be voting during that meeting, but anyone is welcome to come and be a part of that. And just as we share about what we have planned for the coming year and then also to stay for the meal afterwards, we do ask if you are planning on coming to that meal, uh, if you could sign up in the lobby, just give us a rough idea as we plan and prepare food for that. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. Um, uh, but if you are a member of the church and you know that you will not be here 
that Sunday. Maybe you're traveling or something. Um, there are absentee ballots available as of today. So if you need one of those, be sure to find one of the trustees and they can get that to you. Those absentee ballots uh, must be filled out and completed and turned back no later than Sunday, January 7th. And so that'll be here before we know it. So if you need to grab one of those, make sure you see one of them um, after this service. But make sure you mark your calendar for that meeting. But uh, that's all the announcements I think that I have that I wanted to highlight for us. But at this time, if I could have the gentlemen make their way forward uh, for the giving of the tithes and the offerings. Um, And as they're doing that, as we prepare our hearts and minds to be ministered to by the choir, um, let me read our scripture reading for us here from the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Hear now the word of God. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, fathers, we've gathered together this morning on this Christmas Eve morning. We, we thank you for the true meaning of Christmas and that you sent your only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you for that love that you've extended to each and every one of us. Lord, my prayer is that you would help us now, help us as Christians to, to share that same love with everyone around us, that they too may be reconciled to you. And Lord, thank you just for allowing us to come together this morning, like every Sunday morning this past year, um, and worship you as a church family. Uh, personally, I thank you for, for allowing me to be a part of this church body. You know, so many people who sacrifice so much of their time and resources here to help advance your kingdom. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for their sacrificial giving this past year to not only allow us to do uh, the many different ministries that we've done, but, but as we can see on the back of our bulletin uh, this morning, we can also celebrate uh, today that we owe zero dollars on that second mortgage, and Lord, we praise you for that today. Uh, Lord, help us now as we, uh, as we focused on last week um, to continue to work together to follow your guidance and your instructions as we look ahead to the coming year. Lord, be with our service this morning. I ask that everything that we say and we do would be for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And as the gentlemen uh, take the offering this time, and as we get ready for the choir to come and share with us, let's sing together hymn 196. Hymn 196, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day.
We sing today of a holy night, a glorious moment that changed history, a miracle that took place 2,000 years ago. We sing of the humble birth of a baby, a child whose coming had been planned from the foundation of the world, and we sing of a Savior who is coming again. This is the good news of Christmas. We have a story, the greatest ever told, a world in waiting, a world in need of hope, the stage is silent, then the lights come on, the wait has ended, and suddenly
for the world began to unfold. He revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through betrayal, Joseph was taken to Egypt, and through famine, God moved his family there too. For centuries, the people lived in slavery. Then God delivered them through the Red Sea and 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They entered the promised land, became a nation, built a temple, and worshiped God. But though God was in their midst, they descended into idolatry and suffered exile. But God still did not abandon his plan or his people. Finally, in the fullness of time, God used a virgin named Mary, a man named Joseph, a Roman census, and the little town of Bethlehem, all so that his son could be born. That miraculous night, Jesus came into the world as a baby, just as God had always planned.
Jesus in her arms, the words of the angel must have echoed within her. You will have a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. What a miracle. When we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, we hold the miracle of God with us in our hearts. Shepherds stood at the door of the stable. They had run from the hills nearby. With the sound of the angel song in their ears and the glory still in their eyes. As they told of the news they'd been given, Joseph smiled as he stepped aside. For the rest of their days they never forget their glimpse of the manger that of a miracle, when you behold the fulfillment of God's promise, when you stand in the presence of his glory asleep in a manger, you bow in worship and you offer him everything that is costly and precious. That's what the shepherds did that night. It's what the wise men did when they saw him. It's what all of us do when we find him today. Oh, 
timber and frankincense and gold. And they fell and worshipped him. And the world should have known right then. Every knee will bow, even kings will fall. Every tongue confess, you are Lord, you are Lord.
says, After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened. All who heard the story were astonished. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. This is the incredible news we share with the world today. Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir members. As they're making their way back to their seats, let's give them one more round of applause. They did a fantastic, fantastic job for us this morning. The glorious, impossible miracle of Christmas. You know, as, as was mentioned um, all throughout that cantata, uh, to the world around us, many of these things seem impossible. You know, a, vir- a virgin birth, Savior of the world, God with us. But as Christians, we believe it as truth. And, and we don't just say that we believe it. Uh, we base our lives around these glorious truths that the choir just beautifully sang for us. And, and that has been my prayer uh, the last two months, really, as we've been working our way through uh, this first chapter of the book of Colossians. And so if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, uh, just real quick, I want to encourage you to open to Colossians chapter 1 uh, this morning as we finish our time together this morning, just very briefly uh, looking at our tux- text here. In Colossians chapter 1, for those of you who have been with us uh, over the last several weeks, we have been working our way, studying this wonderful passage together here in Colossians chapter 1, specifically uh, verses 15 through 20 of Colossians chapter 1, which is called the Christ hymn. And it's called that because uh, it's unfolding these glorious, majestic things of who Jesus really is. And I'm excited just to take you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes this morning and, and finish this section by looking at those last two verses there, uh, verses 19 through 20 together, and, and rejoice in the glories of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're there, let me invite you to follow along as I read Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul writes this, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You know, one of the things that makes Christmas such a a joyful and wonderful time of the year is the music. And I'm sure many of you have your own opinions about Christmas music, about what songs are good and which songs are not. I'm sure you have an opinion about what, when song, Christmas music should be playing and when it shouldn't be playing. But um, that's one of the great things about this time of year is the Christmas music. And there's these songs that, that we sing year after year after year. And, and many of those songs, uh, you know, they get stuck in our heads and, and we often can sing them and recite these words just from memory. And often we, we do that without really thinking about the words to the songs that we're singing. I know I am, have been guilty of doing that, um, just singing these songs from memory um, because we do it every year. Um, but many of these songs, and, and whether you realize it or not, and it's really stuck out to me in the last month, you know, putting the services together, trying to go through our hymnals, get as many of these Christmas songs in our services as possible. But many of these songs, whether you realize it or not, are filled with the message of the gospel. And, and that's, that's awesome. And, but what's interesting is there's many people this time of year, Christian and non-Christian, proclaiming, the gospel without even realizing it. And, and, and one of those songs that we sing every year is, is the famous uh, Christmas song written by a man named Charles Wesley. And just one year after Charles Wesley's conversion to Christ, he wrote these words. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of of righteousness. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. That's Christmas, isn't it? That's the true meaning of Christmas, that Christ, the son of righteousness, laid aside his glory, was born here, mild if you will, in order to save the sons of earth, you and I. That's the story of Christmas. Yet my fear is that so many people miss it. 
They may sing about it every year, but they don't get it. And so as we finish this section off this morning, you know, looking at the Christ of Christmas, I simply want to try and recapture the meaning of Christmas in this passage here. And I want to do so uh, just by asking two questions from these two verses. Two quick questions. Uh, First question, how did the Son of God come to earth? And second question is, why did the Son of God come to earth? And so that will be our guide as we go through this. Uh, Verse 19 is going to answer question one. Verse 20 is going to answer question two. So question number one is this, how did the Son of God come to earth? And the answer, which we'll see, is, is in the word that we say often. It's the word incarnation. The incarnation. Look what Paul writes here in verse 19. It says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That means the baby born in a manger, the carpenter from Nazareth, the preacher who went around teaching in the hills of Galilee, the man who was convicted, tried, nailed to a cross on Calvary's hill, was none other than God himself. Not just another religious leader, not simply a a teacher with a great personality, not just another prophet, but as Charles Wesley would put it, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And this evening we're going to talk more about that word Emmanuel, that name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. That word incarnation, uh, the first part of that word incarnate is Latin for the word flesh. That Jesus is God in the flesh. That within Jesus Christ is all the fullness of God. In fact, that's exactly what Paul says here. It says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Meaning there is not a single part of God that is not in Jesus. That Jesus is fully God. And God is fully in Jesus. J.I. Packer says, said, said this, It is here that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. The Word became flesh. God became man. The divine Son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on the earth as a helpless human baby. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Well, if Jesus is fully God, you know, if God has come here to this earth, would we not then expect to see great power? Of course, did we not see Jesus roll the storm and walk on the water, feed the thousands? If God truly was here, would we not expect to see wonderful compassion? So Jesus would cure the sick and cleanse the leper and restore the paralytic and raise the dead. If Jesus truly is fully God and God was here on this earth, will we not expect to see this amazing understanding? So Jesus would confound the Pharisees, interpret the law, teach the scriptures, and proclaim the good news. Well, if Jesus is truly God come to earth, will we not expect to see this unseen impartiality? And so Jesus would minister to, to both men and women, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, old and young. If God were really here, would we not expect to see this unconditional love? And so we see in Jesus, sinners received, tax collectors called, prostitutes defended, the unclean embraced. If, if He were God, God were here, would we not expect to see this supernatural confirmation? And so Jesus was born of a virgin, blessed by angels, worshipped by the Magi, baptized by the prophet, anointed by the Spirit, and extolled by the Father 
himself. If God were here, would we not see glorious patience? And yet, he was arrested and there was no struggle. They beat him and there was no retaliation. They mocked him and he remained silent. In fact, they killed him and while they're killing him, he prays for their salvation. If God were really here, would we not expect to see some majestic victory? Or do we not see that after everything the world would throw at him, three days later, he emerges from the dead as the victorious king? All, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So how did the Son of God come to earth? The answer, the incarnation. Second question is why? Why did the Son of God come to earth? And the answer to that question is the word we're going to use that comes from verse 20 here, the word reconciliation. Reconciliation. Verse 20 says this, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. That Christ has come to reconcile, it says there, all things. So this reconciliation of Jesus is not simply a matter of individual people, but it's of all creation. He came to reconcile all things. He wants to reconcile all this world, all of the cosmos. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. This world is a mess. This world is a mess. Things do not work the way that they ought to. This world is unreconciled. It's chaotic. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 21, that creation is in bondage to decay because of sin. Yet we find this amazing truth here in verse 20, that through Christ, God intends to reconcile the universe, to reclaim the universe. You know, it's perhaps it's like an accountant that might reconcile the books, bringing everything into its proper place and its proper order. You know, God intends to bring creation back in order, that all the world will lose its hostility and its chaos, and it will be brought back under the sovereign reign of King Jesus. And when that day comes, we will all gladly sing, No more let sins or sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make His blessings flow far as the curse is found. Of course, chief among whom Christ is going to reconcile are sinners, repentant sinners, right? People who are unreconciled to him. He's going to bring them back into a relationship. Now, when you think about that word reconciliation, that implies that there was once a time where there was loving harmony. That there was a time when man had harmony with God. But we learn in Genesis chapter 3 that that relationship was broken. And as most of you know, you know, in order for reconciliation to happen in any relationship, someone has to take that first step in order to restore that relationship. And so we find ourselves as humanity unreconciled with our Creator. Who is it that takes that step? Well, Paul tells us here, it's very clear. It says in verse 20, and through him to reconcile. That it's Jesus who took the initiative to restore our relationship. That's incredible. That's Im that seems impossible right there. Um, many of you know Bob Holmes. He would often say this in our elders meeting. I don't understand why, but I'm sure glad he did. Right? doesn't make sense to us, but the script, Scripture is very clear to us that while we were His enemies, He befriended us. That while we hated Him, He loved us. While we rebelled, He offered us mercy. Once again, the words of 
Charles Wesley. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. That's what Christ does. That's why he came, to reconcile us to himself, that we may experience true joy in this life. A joy that uh, is not found in some Christmas present that you may or may not receive tomorrow morning, uh, but true joy that is only found in having fellowship with our Creator. And of course, as we see at the end here, um, we see He does this at great cost to Himself. If we read at the end of verse 20, making peace by the blood of His cross. And, and I'm almost done, but here's where those two questions come together. You know, first question, how did he come to this earth? Second question, why did he come to this earth? Well, we find out that he came to reconcile us. And now we discover that he reconciles us through his shed blood on the cross. Therefore, that informs us how he came. He came by becoming a man. And why did he have to become a man? He became a man because so that he might have blood to shed in our place. In other words, the point of the incarnation is the crucifixion. That that cradle is always in the shadow of the cross. And Jesus, being crucified in our place, in the place of sinners under the judgment of God who are in desperate need of a substitute, Jesus died in our place in order that he might save us. I mean, is that not what the angel said that very first Christmas? He said, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which is for all people. For unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He's our Savior. For us to be reconciled, God, the eternal Son, became man and was slain on the cross in order to take our place. Why? Well, end of verse 20 says that, that we might have peace. So in, in light of God's word this morning, this Christmas Eve morning, um, I offer you eternal peace through faith in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And if you're here this morning, you've never experienced uh, that peace in your life, uh, please come and talk with one of us. We'd love nothing more than to share, to talk with you and share more with you about that because that's the whole reason of Christmas right there. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, as we go through the Christmas season, as we rehearse these truths so, that are so dear to us, may this truly be good news of great joy that we would rejoice in our Savior, Jesus, the Christ of Christmas. If you're able, let's stand and, and close in prayer as the music team comes forward. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the great work of reconciliation which Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. We thank you that he was willing to shed his blood on the cross for sinners like us. And we pray that these would not just be old truths that we've learned years ago, but that we would truly be in awe once again in the glorious, impossible miracle of Christmas. And Lord, I pray for those in our world, uh, maybe even some in here this morning, who are unreconciled. May they realize that you offer forgiveness to them, through faith in Jesus Christ. Give them that faith, we pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And as we close our service this morning, let's sing that familiar hymn together, hymn 181, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. <laughs>
remind us of that often, of the sacrifice that you did for us. Um, and uh, we are eternally grateful for that. God, just be with us as we celebrate with our, with our families, as we travel, uh, just give us safety, um, and just, just give us a special time with those that we love um, in this world. Uh, but God, just keep our focus on you uh, this season. Remind us of, of the greatest love that you've ever shown, the greatest gift that you've ever been given. Uh, and again, we return grateful to you all the glory that you would do. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians 9 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Guys, have a fabulous, fabulous, incredible day.